Hello, everyone. Welcome to Six Steps to Improving Employer Retention. I'm delighted that you're here with me today. My name is Linda Janak, and I'm the President and CEO of Talent Guard. And uh, Talent Guard is a full-service talent management consulting and software company, but you'll learn a little bit more about us uh, at the end of the presentation. The information that we're going to be talking about today represents a real case study. Uh, but what we've done is we fictionalized the name under the the pseudonym Medco, so it's not a real company, but the storyline is absolutely real. So we want to do that so it makes this story and the issues and the problems and the strategies more relevant for you. So if you're new to the webinar, you'll see that it's not your traditional presentation. Actually, I like to call these web webisodes, and it's really a storyline. So welcome, and we're going to get started. I'd like you to meet... Charlie. Charlie is the director of Western Sales. He's a top producer. He has about 200 direct reports and he's been with the company for about two years. Now what it doesn't say on here is that Charlie represents about a quarter of the company's revenue, which is significant. And the CEO uh, paid um, huge recruiting dollars to get Charlie into this organization and steal him away from a competitor. So uh, this is a guy that, that the company specifically wanted for his skill set and his Rolodex and his ability to drive revenue at, on the top line. And Charlie works for a company, a medical device company called Medco. And I'm just going to share a little bit about the company so that you have some context uh, about the size and the problems that, uh, or challenges, I should say, that they were facing as they continued to scale that company. So they have about 15 employees. Their goal is to basically double the company in terms of revenue in five years, so that's an aggressive goal. They have an incredible product line. Some of the challenges that they've been faced with is really in the area of recruiting top talent and uh, you know, it's an issue because it's expensive, um, global growth. So they kind of expanded internationally a couple of years ago, and they have it as a strategy con to continue to do so. And a lot of changes are happening in the environment that is forcing them to change their business model and how they, one, develop product, and two, how they actually sell to hospitals, which is their main customer. Now, when Talent Guard went in to assist them with this uh, retention project, one of the first things that we wanted to do was look at the company's website to understand what kind of messages were being sent to employees about how the company felt about them, how they valued them, and to see if it was pervasive in all that the organization did. And we're happy to communicate that the company did a fantastic job of communicating a lot of values around employee development, caring attitude, uh, employees first, uh, you know, driving employee satisfaction. So they had an incredible communications program. The challenge came in the employees really believing it and understanding it. So HR had a gap to fill between what they were communicating and what employees actually thought. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. So the company has about a 22.8% turnover rate. And they may not be high, uh, in your opinion, in some organizations, but it was definitely high to Medco, especially since their, a few of their next closest competitors um, were half of that. So that can cause a real problem. As you know, it's, ex you know, it's expensive to have a recruiting program. It, and it's expensive to retrain people. So Medco is very um, on top of keeping employees and ensuring that they have a great experience so that their retention can go up and they are recognized as an employer of choice. Now, within this company, they you know, were only doing basic equations, if you will, on retention and turnover using some basic math. They had no insight whatsoever into where may the turnover problems be occurring. So that presented a challenge. And 
retention is critical to Medco. So what they were doing is outsourcing a lot of their product development, and because the products are evolving in terms of technology, they found that in order to continue to have a competitive advantage, they needed to keep that uh, as an asset within the company, which meant that their employees needed to develop further skills. So um, that was important. So retention is an issue. As a matter of fact, Charlie, our Western uh, director, wants to resign. He is not happy with the organization. Uh, and in addition to that, what complicates the problem is that several of Charlie's direct reports have already resigned. Uh, and that's a problem for Charlie because Charlie wants to hit his number. The CEO is certainly not happy that uh, Charlie wants to leave because, as I said, he, um, you know, he put a lot of time and energy to find this particular individual for this role, which had been left empty for about six months. And he also is starting to see a problem. So uh, it's an issue that needs to be addressed immediately because he doesn't want to lose uh, any more of his critical posts. So what the CEO does is he solicits help from HR. So I'd like to introduce you to Sarah. Sarah uh, has been with the company for about three years and uh, she's been specifically tasked with improving the retention and she's going to be measured on that metric year over year. So the first thing that Sarah does is she goes and searches for exit interview data. Now within this organization all of that data was being collected either on a Word document or on handwritten notes that were very difficult to decipher. Uh, but that's where she started. So for the people who had left Charlie's team already, she started with those notes. She actually conducted some of the interviews. Some of the interviews were conducted by other HR people. She started there. Then what she did is she met with Charlie. She sat down with him to really understand what was the catalyst for leaving? Can she pinpoint some specific areas of concern? And what she walked away with was really some critical, four critical areas that needed to be addressed if Charlie was going to stay. And the first one being politics, gridlock. So Charlie felt that it was very difficult for him and his team to do his job because of all of the red tape that they had to go through in order to create a quote, to get it signed, to get it approved, and even to get it out their own door. He wanted to try to eliminate that and build more you know, empowerment and trust and transparency within that process. Uh, poor relationship with bosses and peers. Uh, Charlie didn't have a problem with, with his, his boss or, or the CEO for that matter, but we believed, or Charlie believed, that some of his peers may have issues with his style. Uh, a lot of rumblings around compensation, even in Charlie's own group, where he had no control over people's past compensation, he could see a discrepancy between some of his low performers and some of his high perfor performers, and that they there just was not a lot of fairness there. And then... Uh, there was just truly a lack of career pathing, and that specifically was the thing that Charlie dinged the HR team on, is that employees didn't know what career paths were available to them, and if they identified a path that was interested, uh, that was interesting to them, they didn't understand what the gap was. You know, can I get into this if I'm not a fit? Because I've been told I'm not a fit. What do I need to do to close the gap? And that was very frustrating. So these may be reasons that you've heard in your own organization. It might sound familiar um, uh, because these are some popular issues that tend to happen as organizations continue to grow. So Sarah needed to better understand that phenomena, those four points and others, at a much granular level. So the first thing she did is she looked at all the exit interview data that she could find. And... Um, she found about 3,300, I'm just going to call them worksheets. It was all paper, and her desk pretty much looked like this. And her goal was to, first and foremost, develop a tracking spreadsheet um, with all the key pieces of information that she wanted to be able to run reports on. And she didn't start with everything. She started with a few that you see here. She categorized it into voluntary or involuntary. 
and then special characteristics. So things like age, gender, did people leave because of their manager, so that she could start querying on this information. Uh, the problem with those 3,000 forms is some of it was outdated because she, she found data across three or four years. Uh, but a lot of the data within that was unusable because she couldn't decipher it. So some of it was handwritten. Um, some of it, when the exit interview was conducted, there were notes but no check boxes. Some the form was not adequate enough to be able to track some of these things. So she learned a lot about what her exit interview needed to look like in the future. So that was critical. Then what she did is she developed a tracking spreadsheet uh, just using Excel because they didn't have any other tool at the time. And she and two of her colleagues, as well as like one or two other data entry people, entered as much data as they could into the spreadsheet so that they had some fundamental base benchmark data that they could start to work with to build some charts. So let's take a look at some of those findings. Um, boom. All right, so turnover by age and gender. If we look at this, it might look like, okay, this, this is great. It looks like we've got some people retiring at the 65 plus. You know, there seems to be some closeness in terms of male and female. But what this chart doesn't say, and an assumption that needs to be investigated is, hmm, what percentage of the 55 to 64 are about ready to walk into that retirement bucket? So if it's a significant amount, that could cause a huge problem in terms of knowledge transfer, um, gaps, and uh, holes within the company. If we look over at turnover by age and job function in the upper right, it's very clear to me that there is a problem in the middle management ranks and the non-executive ranks among people 25 to 44. So there is a problem in those two groups that needs further investigation. Turnover by specific region, uh, reason and gender. Uh, we can see the two most popular reasons people are leaving is for career development and relationships. Now what we thought when we were doing this is, oh, people are just leaving because they're not getting paid enough. Well, in this particular instance, although that's usually a very high factor, it did not resonate in this case. And then, again, breaking it down by turnover versus voluntary. And as we said, we had about 45 different charts, and we sliced the data in many different ways. Because once you have the data, you can do that. And you may look at other things, but this just got us started. Um, and then what also happened is we started to wonder, well, you know, we're doing these employee surveys annually. We're making employees invest the time. We're investing the time. Is there any correlation between the annual survey and the exit interview. So she went back and she compared the data of, on the left, what employees said they wanted and what was important to them, and we broke it out into male and female, and why employees are leaving, and there was a head-to-head -head, um, similarity across the board. So obviously what it meant to us was, wow, everything that we do needs to focus on those three critical areas and all the rest can be handled in another program. Now, what was awesome about the data analysis, like meaning putting all the exit data in a spreadsheet, was that we had a lot of demographics on, you know, age and gender and diversity and department. What we didn't have, we but we did not have that data for the annual employee survey. So it was very difficult for us to break down career development, relationship with manager, and compensation at a more granular level to understand those specific needs as they come into the organization and as they continue to stay. So what we learned from this is that we really needed to improve the way that that annual employee survey worked so that we had, even though it was anonymous, more data that could be, uh, that reports could be run on. So that's something to think about in your own company. So based on that data, we knew that some intervention was required. And Sarah put together, uh, with our help, a six-step plan. And this six-step plan is what we use to communicate to executives, to get buy-in, to the managers, to teach them what we were doing, and to marketing to help us communicate the strategy that would be unfolding over the next year and a half. So that six-step plan included digging deeper into the retention data, as I mentioned, uh, looking at, you know, slicing and dicing the data in different ways to learn uh, more about what was going on in our own company. Define what a culture of empowerment looks like at Medco. 
developing a strategic retention framework, aligning the retention strategies and tools to that framework, developing an action plan, and then Sarah's favorite thing to do is measure, 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 measure. And then once you measure it, you can improve it and then communicate it um, to all stakeholders in the organization. So let's take a look at digging deep into the retention data. So as we mentioned, you probably look at data uh, in two fashions, looking at both retention data and turnover data. You can see it's stairs and levers. Um, most organizations use these two metrics only, and I've seen it in both large and small. Um, this can only tell you so much. I can look at this data all day long, and what I can't tell you is, well, what the problem is, even within these numbers. So our retention rate, 90%, wow, that's great, but what does that really look like? What does, is retention two years? Is it three years? Is it seven years? And then why are they staying? What's happening? So you need to look at both of the data, uh, hard data, and then more of the qualitative data, if you will. But before we move on to that, that discussion, you also should look at data based on special characteristics. So in Charlie's case, you know, the number of people leaving um, divided by the total number of leavers. So what is Charlie's specific turnover rate, rate in the Western region? Uh, and we can see here that his percentage is even higher than the overall corporate percentage. So that probably needs some further investigation. So the areas, again, that Sarah was, um, was really interested in looking at is breaking it down in terms of voluntary, new job education and retirement, involuntary, termination, health issues, and RELO, and then those special characteristics so that she could really come up with some great programs. Now the reason why you want to look closely at those special characteristics is because it will tell you it needs to be fixed. As in the case of looking at the data between the employee survey and the exit survey, that gives us that high level data. Now let's get specific. Employees will tell us what needs to be fixed, and then we just have to figure out when and how we can fix them. So let's think about a few assumptions here based on some of the data that we've already collected, specifically in and around Charlie. Well, some employees who were and are supervised by, by Charlie have problems with his style. So that became evident through a 360. Employees do not see career potential within the sales group, and when we actually looked at how many career moves up, down, and across happened, we can only find one. Um, and just within the western region, that's 200 employees, so that's not, that's not good. Um, that we may need to actually better understand Charlie's management style. Is he too aggressive? Is he too domineering? Uh, because that may be an indicator that um, we know we need to put a specific development plan in place for Charlie, and that compensation had to be addressed in, within the department and across the organization and not just comparing your compensation to your competitors compensation to the industry to statistics. So looking at it at a much more granular level. And the way that Sarah was going to approach this problem or the way she did approach the problem is that she wanted to start breaking down some of the data and some of the information and the programs into three key areas. Culture fit, job fit and career fit. And we're going to talk about those through defining what a culture of empowerment looks like at Medco. So the first thing that you want to do when you're embarking on any initiative is to include the people that are impacted. So what Sarah did in this case is that 25 to 44 group, that sales, um, that sales segmentation, both the gender and the age, and get that representative group so that they could act as the ambassadors for the actual culture of empowerment program. They're going to be the ones who go back to their employees, get that information, and bring it back to the table so that many of the areas of the company could be represented and it wasn't just executives pushing it down. So what we're really doing is getting buy-in from the bottom, and these people are going to be our communication experts that help other people buy into the change. And it was this task force's job 
to engage the C-suite because as you know anything that's not adopted by the C-suite has a hard time staying and being sticky for a long time so they wanted to make sure that the C-suite was aware of uh, of the issues of the actual problems when the, with with the turnover and retention and what they were going to do about it and get those executives to communicate the importance of the program um, they also needed to identify empowerment values and themes they needed to identify specifically what things, what strategies, what tactics are, are, need to be put in place in order to act on these values and themes. So being able to define that and then creating the actions to, to get it going. They were going to come up with that cultural, culture of empowerment credo, which I'll talk about momentarily. Building the framework to drive the change and then how do we know that people are acting on these once it's out there? How are we going to uh, communicate and recognize when people are doing it right? So through this task force, and, and really what happened were lots of meetings over the course of a couple, several weeks. It was like a six-week span where they started taking all of the mission and vision and values and the data, all the stuff that was posted on the websites and in their employee manuals, and laying it out on the table and asking the question, what do we really want to preserve? And I won't read all of these to you, but a couple of things that they absolutely did not want to lose is that focus on performance. Transparency um, was something they wanted to preserve, but not all employees in the organization felt that it was happening to the best of, of the organization and innovation. Those are some of the th things that they wanted to carry forward as they develop their credo. But there are a lot of things that needed to be plugged in that either were not working well or had never been introduced at all. And recognition program was one of them. They did not do a good job recognizing people and making people feel special and valued and happy other than their you know basic annual increase. Uh, they wanted a stronger recruitment process, most specifically using assessments in the process to help do two things. Are they a culture fit? And two, how close are they in alignment with the job and working around some of those semantics so that it's in compliance with all the right laws? And then career pathing. How do we let people know that there are opportunities with our organization? And it doesn't matter if you're large or small, um, personal growth is, is part of that career pathing discussion. How do I gain more knowledge? How do I gain more skills? And how do I advance, whether it's up or across the organization? And I'll only stay on this slide for a few minutes because we are going to post this to the web uh, after, and you can read it in all detail, but they wanted as the foundation an employee credo. And what that meant is, what can we tell employees we feel and believe about them specifically and how are we going to act on this every day and recognize people when we see it happening and what is going to drive uh, all of the decisions that we make. So um, they, they started by developing a credo and then getting it uh, accepted and adopted and that was both at, at the task force, then they had a management discussion, then they had an executive discussion. So lots of people got to contribute to this before they made it. Um, stick, if you will. And then they use this in all of their communications. They put it on the wall as they would, put it on the website with the rest of their communication materials. And in addition to that, that was the foundation. That's how they got started. And that foundation enabled them to develop a strategic retention framework. And what we've called it in another term, because we like it better, is the culture of empowerment framework. So you can choose any terminology that you like, but we really like the empowerment. And as you can see there, they're leading with that employee credo. And then it breaks down into those areas where Sarah really felt they wanted to have um, a spotlight on in each of the areas. And job fit is really about looking at the vision of the company, looking at the employee's personal vision, the skills and interests fit, and compensation. Within the culture fit area, we're looking at manager and peer support, shared values, and how the employee resonates with um, what the company does for the community and what the company does just overall. And then career fit is all about personal growth, career development, and job learning. And what we're going to do 
is break each of those down and talk about them uh, at a much granular level in a minute. But assuming we've got the credo right and we've got the job culture and career fit right, that theoretically is going to drive engagement, motivation, and recognition. And in the case of Medco, we had significant improvements based on um, just the survey they did on the last employee survey. Now, if you get it right and you have all of those components, you're going to have improved retention. And really the goal about improved retention, right, is that you are an employer of choice. People want to work from you, and they want to stay in the house because they feel you have heart. And all too often... I think we lose the feel factor in business, and the feel factor is what, empl what makes employees want to stay. So try not to lose that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's break down each of these components and think about what's important to measure. Now, I'm going to just give, you know, basically one question per area. We had many questions per area, but... What I wanted to communicate in this particular slide and the ones that follow is that it's not about do employees understand the vision. You know, that's a yes or no. But what you really want to understand is to what extent do they buy into the company's vision and mission. Now, to what extent is going to be a range, right? So if, you know, you're averaging, uh, you know, high, that means that you could walk up to any employee and they would be able to recite the vision and mission without flaw. If you're coming out in the middle, whatever your middle is, and they can in, in recite some and not others, there's two things happening. Either we're not doing a, a good job communicating or they're really not bought in, and we have to understand why so we can move the needle. So the kinds of questions that you see here is always about the extent of, because that's really what you want to measure, because that really gives you the ability to put a spotlight on the problem and really hone in what needs fixing and, and is it such and is it a problem that we even want to tackle is it is it painful so when you look at some of these questions and you're thinking about what to basically assess think about your assessments in terms of these words same thing for culture fit to what extent do managers have the skills to manage performance and grow employees all too often. I mean, I can tell you, survey after survey, they're like, our managers don't have the skills. And then I'll say, what skills don't they have? And they say, well, I don't know. I say, well, we don't know the extent then. We really have to dissect that. And there are tools out there to do that, like 360s, where you have ranges. Um, to what extent do employees feel their environment is caring? One of the number one factors of retention is that they f employees feel that their manager cares about them, their company cares about them, and their overall company cares about them, and they're on a caring team. So um, use that word. I think it's a very powerful word to assess where you're at. Um, now let's take a look at career fit. Same thing. And when I think about career fit, personal growth in particular, to what extent are employees expanding their knowledge? I really look at personal growth as a knowledge increase. Career development typically is about up, down, or across the company. Those are physical moves, if you will. And when I say down, I think that's a very important thing. People who are retiring, for example, may not want to retire out of your organization, but they may want to step down or decelerate into a role that doesn't have as much responsibility. So these are things that you should be questioning and thinking about within your organization, especially if you're going to have a mass exodus of people who are at retirement age. And then job learning. What are those specific skills that I need to continue learning in my specific occupation? And all of these are important together. But as you know, we can't do surveys every month or every quarter because it's just not feasible, one, for the employees because they're busy and for HR to be able to really look at that data and act upon it. So Sarah wanted simple metrics. I guess, litmus test, if you will, that she could use and managers could use on a daily basis to see if they were working toward that goal of becoming the employer of choice. And the three simple things that were being measured basically on a day-to-day -day basis was, do employees appear generally happy? And are they smiling often? Are you hearing employees say they feel happy? If you're not hearing it, there's probably a problem. It's that simple. Um, in terms of motivation, 
employees do their best and take initiative to do more? Are employees asking to do more? Are they stepping up? Are they saying, I feel valued? And you can see here, the theme is feel. You want to hear employees use that word. Recognition. Employees communicate their experience and achievements with everyone. On their Facebook page, on LinkedIn, on their performance review. They're talking to people. You're seeing it. You're hearing it. They're participating in your volunteer events, if you will, if you have them, like building a house together, or even going bowling together. Um, we want to hear these words. And if you can get employees talking about these, using these words in, in over and over and over again, it's going to start to change culture because culture starts with literally one word at a time and then making sure that that word is implemented and then recognized throughout the company. So think about what your three might be. Now, having that retention or that empowerment framework is one thing, but we have to be able to act on it in a way that's going to drive results. So we've put our strategies into those three buckets as well. So under job fit, you can see that we need to develop a strategy, as we said before, around recruiting. We need a stronger onboarding program. Uh, currently, they had one that lasted literally three days, and it was mostly administrative in nature. One around performance management and what's important to actually manage compensation. Under culture fit, it's all about integrating the 360 feedback so we can have a very diverse look at what managers and employees really think. Uh, about the company and about each other, um, improving the employee surveys because they were already doing them, but as we said before, it was hard to really distill and break that data down into different parts, discrete parts, and we want to have more of that. One of the things we needed to plug in that we spoke of is training managers as coaches uh, because we found more often than not the managers were afraid to have those performance and those career development discussions because they just weren't sure themselves because they're not taught how to develop their career, so how can they go and, and teach someone how to do it? Because sometimes we just land in these roles for whatever reason. So teaching them actually how to do that. And in the career fit area, uh, introducing a career pathing program because they did not have any kind of program, formal program that existed. We want to make development planning central and core to the organization as its leading development tool. Typically, and in this case with Medco, development was happening post the performance review, which I don't feel is a good strategy. I think development planning is your core, and you integrate performance planning around that, and as well as job training that's relevant. Now, the organization had a great catalog of courses. We're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars annually on that training catalog, but only 12% of, of the courses were actually being used by people. So it kind of gave us some insight there. So let's talk a little bit about Sarah's action plan that she and the team put in place to start driving change. Now, remember I just showed you a minute ago that we had the job fit and we had some of those strategies like retention and performance and compensation. Now, I have a particular strategy slide for each and every one of those four or three areas, depending on which category we're talking about. But if I went through all of those, I might bore you to death. But I do have them in the presentation. And if you want them, uh, I'll, just let me know at the end of the presentation, and I'll be sure to include them. They're just hidden right now. So let's take a example, an example of each area, just to give you a feel for the type of information that you're going to need, one, to sell it to your organization, and then to measure it to make sure you're doing the right thing. So in this case, what Medco did is they decided they need to, needed to overhaul their performance appraisal process. Now, since the inception of the company, they always had one standard template that they used with every single employee. And that just wasn't good enough moving forward because we wanted to become also a culture of performance and of, of accountability. So in order to do that, we need to actually measure what's most relevant in each of those departments. So we decided to move forward with a department-based performance review that the managers all had input to. So they were bought into this because it's the things that were important to them without losing the ability to run benchmarks. So we did that, and it took you know almost a year to actually roll it out across the whole company. So it's not something that happens overnight. We've got to you know give it time uh, to actually do it and do it right. 
And the goal was that there would be a 50% improvement, that's the metric, on manager and employee discussions. So what Sarah and her team did is they had many, many meetings with each of these department heads to help them develop their custom appraisal forms. They migrated from a one time per year to a more frequent model because, as I mentioned earlier, the development planning became the core and central strategy. And then the performance review, and they in integrated an interim, uh, became something that happened uh, on a regular basis, but not as regular as the development planning. Now, a lot of organizations have something that they call a probationary period, and sometimes they do reviews or not, but we felt that that was driving toward the detriment of the organization, even though they didn't do a formal review. So what we wanted to do to try to overcome um, one of those criticisms was to introduce a 30, 60, and 90 day, what we're calling encouragement review, or you could call it an empowerment review, with the goal focus to be on positive outcomes. And what we're really trying to understand is, based on our, and we had an onboarding strategy, so this really ties into that, based on our new onboarding strategy, which is a 30, 60, 90 day plan, are we moving the needle in terms of making the employee feel more like they're fitting in. Because the more fit in that they feel in those first 90 days, the it's been proven through research, the, the greater your retention. Because you lose a significant amount of people within that time for whatever reason. For, on your half, it might be performance. On their half, it just might be that they don't feel like they're fitting in and they feel lost. So that program was imperative to, um, to the program. And then really looking at that compensation, and uh, that's one of the latter strategies that they worked on. And, and they did an initial review of the data and found that there was a huge discrepancy between some of the low performers and high performers across the organization. And now they're starting to just now invoke strategies to try to change that because that's a touchy one, as you can imagine. In terms of culture fit, they wanted to train 2,200 managers on a coaching methodology using both face-to-face -face and online. And the program that they chose was the Professional and Career Management Coaching Framework. And this is also something developed by Talent Guard. So I would encourage you to learn more about it. They created an initial pilot uh, with 40 managers. And those were the 40 we trained face-to-face. -face. The rest of them were online, um, both online in terms of uh, online live webinars and uh, a self-paced study program. So we ran them through the pilot. We um, worked with each of those managers to start coaching their employees. Uh, we had a 30, 60, 90 day post, how is it working discussions and survey, and then tweaked the program so that managers really could and be coaches on an everyday model. And then the third area, career fit. We looked specifically at career pathing because, remember, these were the three goals that were important um, on the, both the employee survey and the exit. So implement a visually driven career pathing program for critical and hard to fill roles. Now, when you're looking at career pathing, uh, most organizations get overwhelmed because they're thinking, how am I going to, I don't even know how to career path. I don't know what the progression paths are. Well, Talent Guard helps with that, number one. But you have to break it down. Sometimes you can start with department. Sometimes you might start with grades, sometimes grade or levels. Sometimes you might want to start with a, you know, with with a region. In this case, we're doing the critical and hard to fill roles because those cause the most pain to the organization if they're not filled. So what we wanted to do is identify feeder roles within the organization that would fill these critical roles. So what we had to do first was overhaul the job family structure. They had a, you know, they had a fairly good structure, but what happened to that structure is it got diluted over time. And what I mean by that is when I started looking at, for example, job description for sales executive in different departments, there was so much variation that it would it's nearly impossible to have something standardized where we can build gaps off of. So that was the first step, is to really clean those up. And remember, we only cleaned them up for the critical and hard-to-fill roles and then the feeder role. So it was probably a combination of about 120 um, roles or, or positions that we were looking at. So it wasn't too overwhelming to get started and to train the organization on how it was going to work. So then we developed all the job profiles that were consistent. Once we had that, then we could run gaps on the progression relationship. So if I'm a um, sales associate, 
what are those progression paths? Can I move to sales associate one? Can I move to business development? Can I move to marketing? And that's the next step, making those and then being able to show the employee, if you do move in one of these directions, doesn't matter which one you choose, you can choose all of them, it's going to show you specifically the gaps that exist between the employee's talent profile and the job profile. So that serves up some tremendous information in a very visual way that helps employees and managers have those incredible dialogues around where do you want to go with your life and where do you want to go with your career. And then as part of that, there was a massive communication campaign to engage employees on this one, one area. Now, that's all great and good, but how do we know it's working? How do we know that our investment in our people and our time and our programs and our software, whatever it may be, is actually working? Well, we've got to measure it. So the first thing that Sarah did was she kept it small like she always does. She, she tries to get something working first and then she grows it from there. Well, she coordinated a meeting between Charlie, the CEO, and herself. And the sole discussion was about how Charlie could apply the culture of empowerment plan with his team. And as you know, he was ready to resign and he's kind of buying into this. He's thinking, okay, maybe some of these things are going to be addressed. Maybe there are things that I can help my team with. Maybe I should give this a chance and become part of the solution uh, rather than abandon it as a problem. So that is a win right there, is changing the mindset. And now we're going to change the behavior because the behavior is a lot more difficult to change because behavior is typically consistent, but it does change over time with the right focus. So Charlie implemented many of the actions in the plan with his team, and I only showed you three of them, uh, and there were many, many more. So he broke it down into job fit, culture fit, and career fit. So he implemented a new performance review. He did a 360 with his team so they could give him feedback anonymously about what he needs to improve on. He developed um, with the HR team for his critical roles some some. Uh, feeder roles and career pathing, and now he's having those discussions with the team, which is making the team very happy. You can see we've got a lot of great smiling faces on Charlie's team now. So we're moving in the right direction. Uh, specifically, what we found after uh, we did a six-month survey with Charlie's team, and it's helping to improve employee satisfaction in four areas. Transparency. So the team felt that there was no longer a lot of gridlock, that they had more transparency with the organization and with their leader. They had more open dialogue with Charlie. Um, they were able to say things to Charlie um, that they could not say before or were afraid to because they had fear, they were driven by fear. Now they're driven by open dialogue and transparency uh, and being happy. So. Um, better compensation. So Charlie is working with HR, as I said earlier, on this one particular thing, and that's just taking a lot longer to, uh, to change. But they feel that they're um, more open because they can earn more commissions now because there's not so much red tape. And central to the entire organization is they loved their custom development plans because it reflected specifically their needs and it was reflective of their 360, of their performance review, and of their career plan. Now, they didn't achieve excellent scores, but they were certainly moving from good to great. And that is the best kind of outcome that you can have. So Sarah was absolutely thrilled to be in a position to provide meaningful data to her CEO and to her organization overall. She finally had benchmarks that she could use on a quarterly, monthly, annual basis so that she could continue to refine and improve her programs. And she was thrilled in part with Talent Guard uh, for helping provide some of the solution, both in terms of consulting and in terms of um, software deliver delivery to be able to help her uh, with her program and Talent Guard has uh, six modules. It's delivered via SAS. You can start with one module and add on. Uh, specifically, she used Performance 360, Career Path and Development 4, but those four modules um, were gradually introduced over time. Specifically, to solve the problems mentioned here, she used 360 to understand culture, her culture, and management issues, as the example I used with Charlie. She used Performance to track the top and bottom performers and what they needed to do about it and why. 
they used a career pathing tool to have that visual interactive way to look at different pro um, progression paths within the company and across departments and across geographies and they used the development tool to track and interact uh, on employee gaps and goals and so uh, with all of that data and with their HIS system they were able to track quarterly hiring and turnover data which gave them so much insight into their organization that they were able to make better decisions more inform informative decisions and drive toward that predictable predictive people development which is really what talent guard is all about is getting to that um, that point in your organization where you can see what may happen so to be continued um, we have some upcoming webinars and as you know if you've been on these before they're all narrative in this way and they tend to build the story builds on these characters and builds on these case studies of organizations that are experiencing these because I find that it helps you in HR to communicate it to your leadership team um, and to your employees to give you tools that you can use today to sit with your CEO and to use in your communications campaign to help you get the things done that you need to get done. So I encourage you to look back at the website on our resources page, past webinars. You'll see on that page we have probably, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 webinars similar to this on all different topics. Um, in addition to that, if you're interested in any of our demos, you'll, you'll see on our upcoming webinar page, those are two different pages, that you can sign up for Talent Guard's uh, performance demo, and there are many demos scheduled for different products, so you can look at the dates there. Uh, but to be continued is how do you now communicate strategies to help you build that company-wide talent management mindset. So once you've decided to move forward with something, how do you actually get buy-in? Uh, in addition to that, we are happy to schedule a demo.